now I think we have Scott with us. Is, is that right? Are you here, Scott? I am here. Hello. Hello. What is it, one o'clock in the morning? What the heck are you crazy people doing awake at this hour? My God. <laughs> Wait, I've this got is, to introduce this you. This is like, this is, I'm like, my, 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 my nightly sleep is half over by now, usually. <laughs> you people are all up talking. I'm turning on my computer. And there's cows We're running weird. around and sheep and man. You have to let me talk because I have to rave about you, which will be easy. So I'm formally introducing you, Scott Beckstead. You are the campaign director at the Animal Wellness Action Centre for Humane Economy, and you'll be discussing your work for wild horses or mustangs and donkeys or bureaus in America. This is of significant importance as the Kosciuszko Brumbies are suffering the same fate here in Australia. Um, I read that you were raised with horses and other farm animals on a small family farm in southern Idaho, and you obtained your bachelor's degree from Utah State University and your law degree from the University of Utah. You practiced law on the central Oregon for many years and served as the mayor of Waldport, Oregon during that time, and you now work full-time in the animal protection sector. You've taught animal law at the University of Oregon and Willamette University Law Schools. And in 2000, you co because because you haven't done much with your life so far. So um, in addition to that, you co-authored Animal Law, the first case book on the subject, and you continue to teach animal law, animal agricultural law, wildlife law and policy, Alaska wildlife law, biodiversity. Are you are you are you secretly 150 years old? Um biodiversity and species conservation law and cannabis law and policy as an adjunct professor of law at Willamette University. You also provide training to law enforcement agencies on how to handle and work with these animals and how to investigate equine and livestock cruelty and neglect. You also serve as director of campaigns for Animal Wellness Action and the Centre for a Humane Economy, and you're featured in Ashley Avis's award-winning documentary film, Wild Beauty, Mustang Spirit of the West, and we do welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Scott. Well, thank you. It's uh, it's it's an honour to join all of you, and uh uh, thank you very much for having me on. And and uh, first, let me just tell you uh, how sorry I am uh, uh, that uh, that I because I know that uh, you must be devastated with what is happening to your Brumbies um, right now. Uh, you know the 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 biggest difference I think uh, in terms of the legal structure uh, between our two countries is that um, we have a law that was written to protect our wild horses and burrows. And uh, it is being badly abused, that law. But, um, you know, in 1971, Congress unanimously passed the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act at the behest of millions of school children and members of the American public who became aware that uh, Mustangs were being uh, badly exploited and abused uh, on public lands in the American West. And um, um, and so Congress passed this law that was meant to protect them and to, uh, you know, give them a place to be on our public lands. Uh, they were elevated as a species that uh, was central to American culture and, you know, played a critical role in uh, the development of our nation. Uh, and here we are now 50 years later, and the federal agency that was charged by that law to humanely manage our wild horses and burrows is engaging in the very acts of cruelty uh, and abuse that gave rise to the law in the first place. Uh, we do not, you know, we, th thankfully we have um, uh, an agency that uh, is not yet going up in helicopters and shooting our mustangs and burrows, but they are chasing these poor animals into uh, traps 
and they are then transported to crowded, filthy, disease-ridden government corrals. Um, and, you know, the government has been on an aggressive campaign over the past uh, two years uh, to really ramp up the removal of tens of thousands of wild horses and burros from our public lands, despite overwhelming public opposition. Uh, they are listening only to the beef industry, the livestock industry, and to a lesser extent, the mining and energy industries that want the wild horses gone, just like they want the wolf gone, the grizzly gone, uh, the mountain lion, the coyote. They want all of these creatures gone. If it can't be hunted for sport or sold by the pound, they don't want it on our public lands. Um, and, you know, it, it's it, it we, we talk about, you know, you would think that things would be better under the Biden administration because, you know, Biden loves to tout his you know, his climate change bona fides, and he's talking all about, you know, wanting to do what's right for the environment. And yet, uh, just like Trump, just like Obama, just like Bush, um, they uh, have just done the bidding of the global meat cartels. And the global meat cartels are really driving this push to get rid of any wild species that impairs their bottom line uh, all for the sake of, you know, cheap beef and cheap lamb. And so we, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a heartbreaking situation here. Um, so, uh, you know, we are, um, it, if I could, I can share my screen and show you a, a, a little bit of a presentation. Would that be okay? Yes, please. All right, let me see if I can find it here. Here we go. So uh, this is the uh, the uh, PowerPoint that I uh, that I show members of Congress um, when I'm meeting with them to uh, to talk about the crisis out on our public lands. Um, uh, okay, so um, here's 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 what I tell uh, anyone that will listen. The Bureau of Land Management is the agency that manages our public lands in the American West, and they are the agency that is charged by that federal law to humanely manage our wild horses and burrows. But what I tell people is that the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, their most potent weapon against our wild horses and burrows is not the helicopter. It is disinformation. Uh, and this is this has been the most vexing part of this situation, getting the news media, Congress and people to wake up to the fact that our federal government is lying uh, through its teeth uh, about the pretext and the reasons and the justifications for these mass removals. Um, it is, uh, you know, whenever the BLM talks about, you know, that we have an overpopulation of wild horses on our public lands, it's not about that. It's about the money to be made by uh, clearing horses off the range and allowing more uh, cattle and sheep to graze. And I want you to look very carefully at that photograph there because what you're looking at are thousands and thousands of sheep. And that is the Sandwash Basin Wild Horse Herd Management Area in Northwestern Colorado that the BLM said couldn't support 700 wild horses. So they went in and rounded up uh, 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 almost 500 of them. Uh, and then just weeks after rounding up 500 horses and sending them to, you know, those, those terrible corrals on the basis that the range couldn't feed that many horses within just weeks, 5,000 sheep turned out onto that same area uh, and and this is what we see uh, all across the American West. We see the federal government saying, oh, we've got to round up these horses because they're damaging the range and the range can't support them and the horses are going to all starve to death and it's it's just terrible. And they go in and they round up, you know, a few hundred or, a, you know, a thousand horses or whatever. And then right after that, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of commercial livestock turned out onto that same area. Um, this is just a, I know it's it's sort of uh, dense and I don't expect you to look at it, but basically uh, what the BLM's own uh, grazing data shows, 
this is the agency's own data, shows that over 50% of its uh, grazing lands are overgrazed. And overwhelmingly, the cause of that overgrazing is livestock. And the BLM's own data shows that less than 1% of the overgrazing happening on our public lands is caused by horses. The BLM does not want people to know this. This is why people like myself and many others are out there trying to get this message in front of Congress and the news media, uh, because it's, again, it, it has nothing to do with too many horses. We're talking about right now, there are probably maybe 60,000 wild horses and burros living on 27 million acres of public lands across 10 Western states. Compare that to 2 million cattle and sheep. Um, and and that is the that that's what the the news media here is really missing. They just take the BLM's press releases announcing an overpopulation of wild horses and 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 as a pretext for conducting a helicopter roundup. And these journalists don't even say, okay, but how many livestock are on that wild horse habitat? Um, and so again, it's the disinformation piece. Uh, I mean, the animal abuse is terrible. Uh, you know, the the overgrazing of our public lands is terrible, but it is the lies, the blatant, bald-faced lies by our federal government uh, that is that is the most challenging to overcome. And we can't even get our news media to give, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there are some good reporters that have that have looked into it, but for the most part, our news media uh, just is doing a terrible job at covering this. Uh, right now, the BLM is trying to drive the wild horse uh, and burrow population down to the number of 27,000, which is the number that existed at the time that the statute was passed in 1971. That is the number that Congress and the president considered an extinction level number. And yet that is the number that the BLM is trying to get our, our, our population down to. And it's going to cost tens of millions of dollars to do this. And in return, they're going to get just a pittance in increased grazing revenues because the BLM only charges these public lands ranchers $1.35 per animal unit month to graze their cattle and sheep. So it's a money loser. Uh, e even if you removed every last uh, horse from the range, it's still a money loser because the BLM will not charge these ranchers the actual market cost. Uh, these ranchers made the lifestyle choice to go out and raise livestock in an environment where they do not belong. And it's we American taxpayers that are funding that lifestyle choice. Uh, and, um, and, you know, uh, again, getting people to wake up to this and also getting them to understand the connection between their dietary choices and the consequences their dietary choices have on our wild species is uh, is something that we're trying very hard to, to get across. Uh, what is the path forward? Uh, the path forward is the deal that was struck. And on the right side of, the, of that screen, you'll see the list of organizations that signed on to the path forward. Uh, this is, and you'll see that it includes the uh, ASPCA, American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and the Humane Society of the United States, uh, which is the organization that I worked for. And when I learned that uh, that the Humane Society had signed on to this terrible deal with the beef industry to drive mass removals of wild horses uh, and burrows from our public lands, I immediately pushed back internally within the organization and said, this is a huge, terrible mistake. And it ultimately, my resistance and my objections led to them showing me my walking papers, which I'm glad they did. I, I, was, I was ready to leave anyway. But um, this is a deal, a dirty backroom deal that was made between the beef industry and the big national humane groups. I know you guys can relate with your RSPCA. Uh, but, um, you know, the deal was supposed to be that in exchange for removing all of these horses to clear off uh, to, or to clear out more forage for the cattle and sheep, uh, that the beef industry would would uh, not be pushing for slaughter. And yet the beef industry is on Capitol Hill all day, every day, 
uh, trying to make sure that horse slaughter remains legal in the United States. We don't actually slaughter horses here. We export them to Canada and Mexico under just absolutely horrific conditions. But the beef industry isn't living up to its part of the deal. And yet the Humane Society and the ASPCA are doing absolutely nothing to enforce the deal and hold their feet to the fire. Uh, these are just some of the promises that were made that no horses would be sold for slaughter and that they'd be adopted to loving homes. Instead, uh, the BLM has this terrible program called the Adoption Incentive Program where they pay people $1,000 uh, per per animal to adopt up to four animals, and these terrible uh, uh, people are uh, gaming that system by adopting these horses. They put them in a corral or out in the field for a year. When they get their certificate of title from the BLM, they then take those horses straight to the slaughter auction. So even though the promise was made that none of these horses that are being rounded up would end, would go to slaughter, we're seeing unprecedented numbers of horses in the slaughter pipeline headed to Canada and Mexico. Um, we also told we're told that these horses would live in a, a natural free roaming state. Instead, they're all standing around in these uh, in these dirty, crowded uh, government corrals. Uh, we we were told that there would be fertility control as the preferred management tool. Instead, uh, the fertility control is nothing more than a token gesture, uh, and the the helicopter remains uh, the primary method for uh, managing uh, horse populations. Um, so again, it's these are these are all promises that were made. Uh, the the two big national humane groups really sold our wild horses and burros down the river. Uh, and um, and it's absolutely terrible uh, that because because if you're a, con a busy member of Congress and you see on the one hand that the beef industry wants the horses gone, but the Humane Society and the ASPCA are OK with it, uh, then that makes it really easy. You assume that, oh, well, OK, the two sides are on the same page. Um, and they're not at so Congress isn't asking any questions because they see that the Humane Society and the ASPCA are on board and they're like, awesome, whatever everyone wants, that's what I'm good with. And so breaking that uh, and getting, you know, getting, um, you know, the other side of the story uh, is is a primary objective for those of us who support wild horses and burrows on our public lands. Um, I would note that uh, we have, although there are some conservation groups that are on the war path to get rid of wild horses, we also have some uh, prominent, well-known, and well-respected environmental organizations here in the United States that have called out the BLM for uh, its lies, for scapegoating and blaming wild horses for harm that's being done to the range by cattle and sheep. Uh, so uh, we do have that going for us, although uh, there's a group here called the Center for Biological Diversity that uh, is uh, is being very aggressive through litigation to try and remove wild horses uh, from different areas across the West. Um, and, and, you know, I, I used to be a big supporter of the Center for Biological Diversity. I worked with them for years and years on all sorts of species conservation efforts. But when they declared war on the wild horses, I declared war on them. And uh, I, I've, I've, I've even gotten death threats from their founder. <laughs> Believe it or not, called me late one night. I'm pretty sure he was drunk. Uh, and he said uh, all sorts of terrible things to me. Uh, and I didn't get a word. In I didn't say a single word other than hello when I picked up the phone. And oh, boy, he went off and said all sorts of terrible things about me and the people I work with. And um, and uh, but, you know, that's the mentality we're up against. Uh, the BLM is that's that, that's a photograph of wild horses being chased by helicopter into barbed wire fences. Uh, the BLM likes to say, hey, we've got this set of humane handling guidelines called our Comprehensive Animal Welfare Program. It's nothing but lip service and window dressing, and the BLM violates its own animal welfare rules all day, every day. Uh, and, and, um, and thank goodness we at least have public observers from other organizations that are there to document this with video. Uh, but the BLM does everything in its power to try and keep those public observers from having a good line of sight to what's going on. And very often they will hide uh, the trap behind mountains and ridges and so forth so that the public observers don't actually see what goes on in the traps because that's where most of the deaths and, uh, and injuries happen. 
uh, this is just a, a a story that happened last year. This is Wyoming. This uh, poor mare's uh, her and her herd were chased for hours and hours and hours by helicopter. She finally collapsed. Uh, and so what did they do? They sent this guy out there with a, a rope. He roped her around the neck and dragged her by the neck into the corrals. Uh, a blatant violation of their own animal handling rules. Uh, but uh, but it just, you know, these are not people who care about horses. Let's be clear. These are people who care about the livestock industry. And they have, they regard these wild horses that most of the American public really reveres and looks upon with a certain amount of reverence uh, as nothing more than tre trespassing livestock. Um, and, you know, you see that in these, in situations like this, where these animals are just absolutely brutalized by these wannabe cowboys who go out and, um, and just do terrible things. Um, so, uh, and this, this is uh, touching on that, uh, the fact that uh, even though we have in the United States a First Amendment right to observe government activities, uh, the BLM does everything it, it can to try and, and keep the public from observing and seeing what's going on. And it's very, uh, I mean, it's, it's extremely disingenuous because the BLM loves to talk about how, hey, we, we invite the public to come out and observe these operations, but then they post the public observers, you know, a mile, sometimes two miles away so that only people with extremely powerful telephoto lens lenses can actually see what's going on. Uh, so we do have, uh, and, and this is actually, um, <laughs> this is actually from 2022, but we, we have the same legislation. We have a good member of Congress, uh, Representative Dina Titus from Nevada. She represents the Las Vegas area. She has introduced this bill, the Wild Horse and Burrow Protection Act, that would ban the use of aircraft to manage wild horses and burrows and would require the BLM to uh, look for more humane alternatives. Uh, another problem that we have is, uh, again, the condition in those holding facilities. This is a, a yearling horse that is emaciated. You know, they, they, our government can't even figure out how to keep or how to keep horses healthy and well fed. And when you go to these these holding corrals, you see horses in this condition with their ribs showing and they are lethargic and they are depressed and they are stressed. Um, and, you know, the BLM hides the number of horses that die due to disease or due to injuries or whatever. We had a big outbreak of disease in two separate uh, facilities um, in, uh, in 2021, a large number of deaths. Uh, and the BLM went in and did an inspection to find out what caused it and, and, uh, and decided to give themselves uh, a B, a grade, a, a grade of a B, which is good. You know, so they sat around, they, they went and after, after you know, hundreds of animals died from an entirely preventable disease, all they had to do was give these horses vaccinations when they arrived, but they didn't, they couldn't even, you know, find it within themselves to do that. So their experts come and they look around and they congratulate themselves with a B grade. We did a good job here. Again, it's just, um, it's mind blowing how, uh, you know, the, the level of gaslighting and deception and just flat out lying that that the government is doing about uh, about its wild horse and burrow program. Uh, this is uh, a letter from members of Congress uh, asking for a congressional committee uh, to suspend uh, or to, to look into the deaths of and, and the BLM says, oh, yeah, we'll get right on that. Thank you, members of Congress, for letting us know how you feel. And then it went about its business doing whatever it wanted anyway. Um, this is a, a new story about uh, House members wanting more accountability, but nothing came of it. Um, you know, we do have members of Congress who care about this issue, but they're in the extreme minority. Uh, and the BLM knows that they're in the extreme minority. So they just sort of, you know, they... They say lots of nice little platitudes to these members of Congress, but then keep doing whatever they're going to do. And then, of course, we've got, as I just told you about the adoption incentive program where uh, the BLM pays people $1,000 per animal to adopt them. And then after a year, gives them the certificate of title. And these unscrupulous adopters then take these animals straight to the slaughter auction. And so they're basically getting paid twice. They get paid by the BLM and then they get, they get paid by the kill buyers that are buying these animals to be exported to Canada and Mexico for slaughter. 
Um, so uh, we do have a bill uh, in Congress that Save America's Forgotten Equines or SAFE Act to ban the slaughter and export of slaughter of American equines. Um, and uh, it, it, that's always a tough battle. We've got a good, uh, I think probably the best shot we've we've had in a long time to finally get a ban passed. Uh, what makes it, uh, you know, sort of a little bit more hopeful this, this Congress is that we have more Republicans who tend to uh, side with the ranchers and the livestock industry. We've got more Republicans on board. So that's a hopeful sign. Uh, but basically, um, uh, you know, that this is a perennial battle to try and shut down the slaughter auctions, the kill buyers, uh, and stop the export of our horses uh, for slaughter. And then we do have a, a bill called the Veterans for Mustangs Act. This is a bill that would require the BLM to uh, recruit, hire, and train our retired military personnel uh, to participate in the uh, fertility control program. I would like to see the bill expanded and, and get these veterans involved in other aspects of wild horse and burrow management, like cleaning up old fences from the range and you know counting horses and maintaining databases. There's all sorts of things that these guys could do, uh, men and women, not just guys, but men and women. Um, and I've met with many of these veterans. They are excited about this. This is also a bill that has a lot of Republican support because our Republicans, uh, you know, they, they like to, uh, to support our veterans or at least say that they support our veterans. So, um, so this is a bill that might have a chance as well. Uh, and then my organization is working on uh, the ROMAC, Restore Our American Mustangs. And it does a, a, a comprehensive top to bottom uh, fundamental it addresses all of these uh, points that I've gone over with you uh, and fixes them. Uh, it, um, you know, it's going to be very tough to get uh, to get this bill passed in the current climate, but uh, but we're going to give it our best shot. And by the way, that stallion right there, his name is Charger, and uh, he's one of my all time favorite uh, wild stallions. I've actually met him. He lives in the West Desert of Utah, um, and he's got an amazing story after the Anaki Roundup. Uh, in the West Desert of Utah in 2021, a group of, of mares and foals were turned out in an area of the range that where they were completely unfamiliar with. They were lost. They didn't know where they were. Um, and Charger here, um, he we don't know how because he was probably over 10 miles away, but he started uh, lifting his head and pricking his ears up and looking in the direction uh, of that herd, and he made his way uh, around a mountain, found that herd of that lost herd of mares and foals, and led them back to the main herd. And uh, it was an act of absolute heroism. Um, and um, you know, so you know, and <laughs> I'll just say this to to sort of close this out. You know, the BLM. Uh, accuses us of wild horse advocates of just being overly sentimental and overly emotional. They scoff at the notion that these horses' relationships with each other mean something. They scoff at the idea that it is psychologically and emotionally traumatizing for these animals to be separated from their families, to separate mares from foals, to separate bonded stallion mare pairs, um, brothers, sisters, um, they laugh, they scoff, they think that that's just ridiculous. These are just animals, you know, who cares? But when, you know, if, if they actually cared about these animals, that they are legally required to manage humanely, if they actually cared enough to go out there and just observe, like we do, like all of us who love these animals so much, just go out there and observe. And it becomes immediately apparent that these are animals that have a very deep and rich emotional life. Uh, that their relationships and that they they value their families even more than their freedom. Um, and yet this is the mentality again that we are trying to overcome. just a it's a it's a, a an internal culture in this agency of um, you know, basically complete disregard for the welfare of these animals and and just a, a sort of an overall, either apathy or outright contempt for these animals that they're supposed to be protecting. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, uh, you know, they, 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 a lot of the people that work for this agency come from ranching backgrounds. And I think that's part of why 
uh, they they have they bear such ill will toward these animals, and it shows in how they're treated. Um, it's it's absolutely heartbreaking to see. So, um, so that's a little bit uh, with um, with what's going on with our American uh, wild horses, our mustangs, and our burros. Uh, it's a it's a, a tragic situation. Um, but it's not as tragic as what's going on down there in in Australia, and what what you guys have going on down there is is beyond horrific. Um, and I just I hope that there is some effort to try and document, um, you know, uh, with photographs and video, um, you know, what must be happening. Although if your government is like mine, uh, they are going to do everything they can to put a happy face on it and hide it as much as possible and just sort of like gloss over the animal welfare implications of, of what they're doing. So um, anyway, Gosh. I appreciate being able to talk to you and uh, and I, I'm happy to take a few questions and then uh, I'm going to go back to bed. How about that? <laughs> Scott, you are an amazing advocate and I'm sorry that you've had to be subjected to death threats and all sorts of other revolting um, things in your work. And there are so many parallels that we can draw in Australia, including the lies that government tell and, uh, you know, the excuses they give, oh, we're doing this to save the native animals and blah, blah, without taking into account the damage that human beings are responsible for, loss of habitat and all sorts of other ways that native animals are being killed off, um, nothing to do with horses, of course. Um, so so that was a stunning presentation and um, uh, I just hope, oh, can only hope that sanity prevails here and in America for these beautiful animals. So, um, uh, yeah, so we've got some chat comments coming through. If you can bear with us, um, Scott, I'll just read a couple. Such yeah. um, this is from Susan Sorensen. Such amazing advocacy and such parallels provided in regard to the lies that are told um, from B Starbright. It's just terrific, abhorrent, and heartbreaking what's happening to the Mustangs, Burrows, and our Brumbies. Thank you for fighting for them. So, well, uh, thank you for those kind comments. You. And and uh, you know, horses were. Uh, horses were my safe space. They were my best friends growing up. Uh, yeah. When I wanted to feel safe, when I wanted to feel comforted, uh, I went out uh, and and uh, and spent time with our horses. Uh, I I owe them uh, because they they helped me as a child, and now it's it's my turn to help them. And I made a promise years ago that I would fight for horses and burrows. I fight for all animals, don't get me wrong. I, I I fight for the creepy crawlies. I love spiders. I insist that we have at least one spider in every single room. I love them all, I do. There's not a single animal out there that you're gonna hear me say anything about hyenas. I wrote, I published a short story about hyenas. I think they're fantastic. Oh. Um, but um, but my fire burns hottest for the horses because of the 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 you know uh, the central role that they played in my in my life growing up. And I I swore long ago that I would fight for them uh, until I could no longer draw breath. And so you know here I am um, doing that. So. Well, we all think you're magnificent and so grateful to you and and. Um, if you would like to try to get back to sleep, then we wish you well. And I, I hope that you come back and speak to us next year or the year after. And I wish you I'd every possible success with your work. And that's great. Can you galvanise the student population to recreate what they did in the 70s? galvanizing children is so yes. powerful we're, yes so we're we're working on that through the uh the wild beauty foundation which is established by filmmaker oh. ashley she made that movie uh, uh wild beauty mustang spirit of the west which i'm sure you uh, would be able to find on your streaming services it's it's on several uh, streaming services here in the states uh it's a it's a great movie it's it's beautiful the cinematography 
uh, around the horses and where they live is just stunning, but it also exposes what's going on. Uh, but part of what they're doing is um, having, they, we do have um, uh, through the Wild Beauty Foundation, a short story contest for youth and a letter writing campaign. So yes, we are we are definitely enlisting young people in the fight. So good. Thank you again so much, Scott, for your time tonight. It's been wonderful. You bet. You all take care and thank you for all the good work you're doing down under. Thank you, Scott. Take you care. Um, so I'm just going to read a few um, chats here. B, if you're still with us, um, Susan Sorensen says, what a beautiful place for the animals and for people who have not yet opened up their hearts. Amazing work. And I was thinking when B was speaking, how glorious to grow up in that kind of environment. Your beautiful daughters are very lucky. Um, and uh, from Ruth Abbey, I'm so impressed by your compassion, creativity and ingenuity. Um and there's a Facebook page for anyone who wants it so that you can learn even more about the owl and the pussycat farm and maybe book into one of those beautiful bedrooms and enjoy all that food. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Ruth Abby's asking, is there a link to where anyone can donate? B, or would you suggest that people go into your website and do it that way? We might have lost B, but I, I think that would be a, a good thing to do. Um, Lisa, excellent. This is from Andy's. Excellent presentation, Lisa. Thank you. I liaise with Madeline at CPG. She helps me refute the lies and bullshit that the New South Wales Minister for Racing and Gambling sends me in response to my emails. Andrea Pollard, thank you, Lisa. Susan Sorensen, thank you, Lisa, for such an informed presentation. Susan Moran, thank you so much, Lisa. Cheryl Zabau, thank you, Lisa. Leon Gross, thank you, Lisa. Ellie Robertson, great presentation. Thanks for Lisa for all your hard work and dedication. And from Neil Jones, is the Greyhound Breeders Trainers and Owners Association more or less powerful than Greyhound Racing New South Wales? Who should be the priority? But Lisa, can you respond to that in this moment, please? Well, we might have lost um, Lisa's connection. She's in um, uh, rural New South Wales, so sometimes her, her internet. Oh, because Susie, you hear me? Susie Linda? Heard, can you respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. It's Lisa, yes, it's Lisa Linda. Um, the Greyhound, yeah, Greyhound Trainers, Greyhound Breeders and Trainers Association do have a lot of power. Um, Neil, um, I will send you an email tomorrow to give you a bit more information. Neil is one of our wonderful on-the-ground advocates around Bathurst and Orange who is championing our cause to oppose the track. Um, but it, it's quite a detailed response, so I will email Neil tomorrow. Thank you so much. Um, Boodle, the person appointed in South Australia by the Premier is associated with the greyhound racing industry, which is a little disappointing, makes you wonder how he can be objective, indeed. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so that's about it. I would just like to finish off by thanking my colleagues Alex and Nadia, who um, you, you won't you won't know how much work they do to make these evenings successful. And my deepest thanks to them. And uh, so, um, just before we leave, um, I would like to mention that our Christmas party will be on Thursday, the 7th of December. And our thanks again to Coletto's for providing this venue free of charge. 
Andy Stevenson from Funky Pies is again generously donating her scrumptious pies and we will have mini festival cupcakes and a bunch of great raffle prizes if you go onto our facebook page under events you can purchase tickets there and of course all proceeds go to helping us continue to speak for all animals and i'd like to on behalf of all of us thank you again so much for joining us tonight and um I hope you all have a safe and happy festive season and we look forward to seeing you here again in 2024. So thanks again and safe travels. Okay, good night. <laughs>